Thanks, Tamar. Um, and Tamar, thank you and JFN for hosting us. I know that there are also a lot of people um, who couldn't be with us right now, um, but who are really eager to um, watch the recording and um, to talk further about this conversation. It's really um, excellent that JFN is, is, uh, is hosting what I think is a really important conversation for the field. Um, so I really would, I know it's like peer pressure when you see a whole bunch of people not putting themselves on video that you also don't put yourself on video, but it really would be such a nicer conversation if we could actually see who's on, who's part of this conversation. So please do feel free to take the plunge and um, put yourself on video and it's okay if you're eating your lunch or whatever as we talk. So, um, so I'm Felicia Herman, I'm, a, I'm the Executive Director of Natan and um, have been since 2005. Before that, was working at the Steinhardt Foundation. And before that, I don't usually talk about this in a JFN context, but before that, I was getting a PhD in American Jewish history. And that training and working uh, mostly at the American Jewish Historical Society when it was back up in Boston, um, where I went to school, working in various archives, it really showed me uh, the importance of having or, or made me really grateful for the foresight and forethought um, that our ancestors had before us in saving papers. Because there was no way that I could have written anything if people before me hadn't decided to keep all the junk that was filling up their filing cabinets and overflowing on their desks and sitting in their basements and all that stuff. And I really, um, from the moment that I started at Natan, I decided that we would keep kind of everything um, just because I knew that it's something somewhere would be valuable to someone in the future. So that's sort of what we're here to talk about today because in all of my years um, now in the field, I'm not sure that I've ever been part of a field-wide conversation about the importance of preserving uh, the archives of philanthropists and foundations. And we definitely know that over the past 20 years, a little bit more, that there's been this massive shift in terms of how change happens in the American Jewish community that so much of it emanates from the funders now. It can, there've always obviously been philanthropists, but they've often come to this work in the context of institutions. So the federations in particular, right? Or, or the, the joint or something. And those institutions were professional and they had mandates to save their papers and, and even a sense of their own legacy. So many of the funders though, who are working today and who are so important in terms of shaping the the future of the Jewish community. I think so many of those folks just kind of are doing it on their own and come to it without necessarily a sense of the historical importance of this work um, or of the fact that, you know, in 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years, people will need to see primary sources that the funders themselves have saved in order to truly understand the period. So there's, for me, there's a, there's a real um, sense of urgency around this conversation right now, um, partly just because it's important for people to save their papers at all, partly because as we shift to being more digital, we're extra incentivized to throw out all the junk that's sitting on our desks or in the filing cabinets, um, and partly because I think we're, most folks, me included, are completely at sea in terms of how to, um, how to save digital records. Um, and then I want to also like inject kind of a note of discomfort. I think there's also a sense in the, in the world today um, that, or maybe there's kind of a changing culture around how funders and philanthropists and people with money and power are viewed um, in, the, in the Jewish community or even more broadly. And if we want our story to be told in a way that actually takes our thoughts and values and perspectives and motivations into account in the future, really the only way to do that is by is enabling people to see the material that we ourselves you know used and whether that's memos or grant applications or you know board meeting minutes or whatever it is so i really feel extremely motivated a strong sense of urgency to have this conversation in the funder community right now so i'm excited that so many people were involved in this conversation i'm going to turn it over to to lila who is a real historian as opposed to me who's like a refugee from from american jewish history um in a second but i be, before we did that we just wanted to see if anyone who's on the call had really pressing top of mind questions that they wanted to ask now because we can shape whatever we whatever we talk about according to what people are interested in hearing more about
All right, well, we encourage you at any time uh, to put a question in the chat um, to if we can actually see you to literally raise your hand. Um, and uh, we're really excited to have this conversation. I also just, let me just say one more thing just by way of framing. I just joined the board of the American Jewish Historical Society. Everybody, all of the speakers today are affiliated, affiliated with the American Jewish Historical Society, but we're not here to pitch the American Jewish Historical Society. We're here to pitch the idea of saving your papers. And, um, you know, lots of folks will donate their papers to their alma mater or to a local historical society. And I think as far as we're all concerned, all that is good. Um, we just don't want stuff thrown in the garbage. So that's what we're, we're here to talk about. So with that, um, Lila, you want to take it away? Yeah. Well, thank you. And um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, this has been sort of like a very personal issue for me because as I'll mention in a minute, the nature of my research. So I'm a historian. I teach uh, American Jewish history, modern Jewish history, and also often uh, US urban history at Temple University. And um, just very briefly to tell you like, how do historians do our job, right? How, how do we do the research that we do? Um, we rely on documents, material culture, different kinds of texts. We need evidence. Um, and in a certain way, uh, and I think that this, I hope this doesn't do too much discredit to my profession, but in a certain way, um, we follow the path of least resistance, right? So where we can find an archive, where we can find a collection, where we can find um, documents that seem to speak to some of the questions that we have and some of the research we're doing, um, we work there, right? And that helps us tell our stories. So any kind of historical narrative that you've read, any books that you've read about history, um, they echo what people were able to find in the archives. Uh, and so, so that sounds kind of basic, but I think it's sort of an essential foundation for understanding what we're talking about today, right? Which is that the things that historians can find end up being what we're able to write about as history. Even though we have an awareness that there's lots of other stuff that was going on, um, and we might try through some different means to, to kind of access that stuff, ultimately, uh, the documents, the texts, the stuff in the archives, they fuel the questions we ask, and they fuel the interpretations we offer, they fuel the history that we tell. Um, so I am writing a book right now about Jewish philanthropy in the United States. Um, and as Felicia was saying, a lot of the big Jewish communal philanthropic organizations um, kept their papers. So the path of least resistance for me has definitely been a lot of these big organizations. And I feel gratitude every time that I read the minutes from uh, UJA Federation, you know, from years and years ago, or I read over a balance sheet from Cleveland's Federation, that people thought, even though these seem like really minute and picky sorts of things, that maybe somehow in the future it would matter. Um, because the things that I end up thinking matter are not necessarily probably the things that people at the time were like, this is incredibly important that we just reallocated this amount of money to some other organization. Um, but it ends up that historians sometimes find things that people at the moment weren't necessarily aware of the, you know, kind of historical value that they might have. Um, as I have worked to kind of bring this history I'm telling into the 70s, 80s, 90s today, one of the major shifts is the rise of all of these different Jewish private family foundations, right, which maps onto all sorts of historical ideas about individualism, about a changing notion of donors and control and power and all of these really interesting kind of historical shifts, um, it has been much, much harder for me to have documentary evidence about the rise of private family foundations. And part of it is because a lot of these foundations are still operating um, and some of them have concerns about privacy. I've had a lot of access to people who will talk to me, um, but as I've looked for the stuff, right, the documents that will also talk to me, it's, it's been a much harder task. Um, and so, it has become, I would say, a little bit of a soapbox I stand on, that whenever I talk to somebody from a foundation and then I ask, well, do you have papers I can look at? And, and it's not that people you know, say, oh, no, absolutely not. But what they usually say is, well, we've never really thought about that, our papers. Like, you know, we're not, we're not that kind of organization. We're not organized in that way. I've tried to say, um, well, please 
think about the fact that absolutely one of your legacies are the programs that you're funding and the work that you're doing to make the world better, however you see that happening, that's one of your legacies. But think also about potentially a much longer range legacy, which is your history. And if you're not really thinking about your archives and having that kind of historical consciousness, I can assure you historians are gonna write about you because it seems to me anyway, that this shift to lots and lots of different private family foundations is one of the major shifts in American Jewish life. Um, and I think in American life more generally. So you're going to be written about. And if you want that record to really fully reflect the work you were doing, the intentionality, um, and even things that you don't necessarily think are so important, um, it's really crucial that you think about your legacy in those historical terms. You think about what it might be that, you know, 100 years from now, when a historian is looking at what was happening in the 20th century or early 21st century Jewish life, that they have your papers. And this is arguably a longer lasting legacy than many of the other, you know, incredibly wonderful things that you do and that you, you know, really think of as, as your legacy in a more immediate sense. Um, and so I guess, for me, the, the pitch is, you know, that everybody on this call and you talk to your friends and you um, talk to people who kind of work in the same space that you do to start to think about, you know, and Melanie will give you lots of practical tips about how to think about um, having this as one of your legacies, which means investing in it the same way that you're investing in all of the other kinds of grant making and work that you're doing. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions uh, now or, or later. And I think Annie um, was going to chime in. And I know she's having a little bit of technical difficulties, but I think we'll be able to hear her. Okay, and Annie's the director of the executive director of the American Jewish Historical Society. And she also is a trained historian. Yeah, so this is probably the first webinar where you have three PhDs in American Jewish history start off. Um, <laughs> but it's wonderful to be here. And I want to thank JNF for hosting this, or JFN rather, and um, Felicia for initiating. Um, so if you have a mission statement, if you have a vision statement, then your materials are really important to safeguard and for so that people can understand decades from now what you were trying to do. AJHS thinks its own story is important <laughs> and in fact um, was started in part in an effort to control the narrative about who American Jews were and whether American Jews could truly be American. Uh, AJHS was started in 1892 at a time where there was a lot of um, anti-Semitism and a lot of ideas that American Jews couldn't be American. And so they started the Historical Society in part to dispel prejudice. Um, and they thought if we can tell the story of Jews who have been here for hundreds of years, who fought in the Revolutionary War, who helped build the country, we will help dispel prejudice. I think the jury is still out as to whether AJHS has dispelled prejudice. Um, however, what AJHS has done is collect the stories of families, individuals, organizations that have shaped Jewish life. And one of the things that I think is so pervasive in American Jewish history and in American Jewish communal life is the importance of organizations. Jews are very good at organizing. Jews are very good at saying, this is important to me right now and I wanna make a difference. I wanna shape American life. I wanna shape American Jewish life. And there's a diversity of ways that American Jews have done that. And AJHS now has a tremendous record of this very important work and very important values. And it's our goal to ensure that this material is saved for the future. So I think a lot of people think that the work they do on a daily basis isn't important for history, but all of us are here to say that it is. Um, on another level, I worked for many years at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. So it was a place that we very much focused on the stories of ordinary people people who would have never thought their story would be the subject of a museum exhibit. 
um, and that reaches people, that affects visitors. And so part of what I've done throughout my life is help shape stories that are going to resonate with audiences. And one of the really nice things about being at AGHS and the Center for Jewish History is that we not only take materials and organize them, but we're able to create exhibits about them. We're able to have a research room where people are able to come. And just to give you a sense of how people have used our historical documents, people have written historical works. Jonathan Sarna, Hazia Diner, Lila Corwin Berman, <laughs> all the amazing American Jewish historians use the records of AJHS. Um, but it's not just historians, journalists, documentary filmmakers. In the last year, there was a film, G.I. Jews, that was on um, WNET, and that came from our archives. There are also, on a totally different note, documentaries about Hank Greenberg. That also comes from our archives. Um, there's a book coming out in June by Julie Salomon, who was a New York Times writer and wrote a book about Wendy Wasserstein and others. Her newest book, which is going to be very big, is about the Klinghoffers and the Achille Lauro and the terrorism. Um, and that book project started here, not in our archives, but actually in a program where that AJHS did about the Klinghoffer family. Um, so my point is that storytelling is very much part of our archival process, but also part of the way that we try to share these stories with uh, a broader public. Um, so Melanie is going to talk more about how you organize your materials and some of the common concerns that we hear a lot from people as, as they go through the process. Um, keep in mind that everything we'll be saying now is more general, but that we work with each organization to kind of tailor the way that we process the materials to their needs, to their mission. It's kind of like a boutique thing. And I think most archives work like that. Um, so most of what Melanie will be saying is true for any archive that would be working with your material. Because again, our primary goal is to make sure that you think about saving your material so that historians, researchers, journalists, filmmakers, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, have the material to do. So thank you all for coming in. I look forward to hearing your questions at the end. So is it me now? Am I? OK. Um, here, just give me a second to share my screen so that people can see my slides. Uh, no, that's not what it is. Now can people see? Okay, um, I'm just going to go through the slides. Um, yeah, so I'm Melanie Myers. I'm the Director of Collections and Engagement at the American Jewish Historical Society. And um, so I'm going to give a very brief um, discussion about some basic concepts when you're thinking about trying to preserve your collections, thinking about potentially donating your collections to a library or an archive or a museum. Um, and when I say we, I mean you know, American Jewish Historical Society in particular, but the we really also applies to any other librarian or archivist or curator that works at a comparable institution um, and how we go about um, preserving collections for access for historians and for others. So obviously Annie and Lila and Felicia have articulated really clearly um, the why you should preserve your collections. I would also say from my perspective, you know, the really, um, what I think is the important part is so you donate your materials to a repository like this and you're ensuring that they will be preserved and they will be stewarded by trained professionals um, who will not only protect them <clears throat> and safeguard them and keep them um, you know, in excellent shape for researchers, but we will also make them accessible to researchers. And the other important part about that um, is that, here, let me move to the next slide here, um, you know, that a good repository will help you tell your story and will work with you to tell your story, the story of your organization, of your staff, of the people you have helped, of your purpose. So it's a chance to make sure that your legacy is preserved and can be studied um, by people who seek to learn from it, um, which is a very important thing. Um, and I think that there's also an added value in having um, 
a lot of collections at a place like AJHS in one place. Because even though sometimes private foundations will allow researchers access to their materials, I think there's really a lot of value added in having them where there are similar collections because it gives it greater context and it gives people a window into that period of time as to what different foundations, um, family foundations, philanthropic organizations were all doing in these particular windows of time. Um, and it allows people to really see the fuller picture of history and to, and to create just a little more of a cohesive story um, for your own papers. So say you decide that you wanna you know, um, think about this. And so we're gonna go through some first steps and some initial discussions. Um, so you think you might wanna donate your materials to an archive or a library or a museum. Um, so what we did is we pulled together a list of four really frequently asked questions that people think about at the beginning of the process that will help you to identify whether you want to do this, um, what would be an appropriate repository for you, and to also sort of uh, to clarify your own internal process about what needs to happen for you to donate your papers. Uh, so, here we go. So, first question, our records are a mess, where do I start? Um, we hear that all the time. The brief answer is, don't be overwhelmed, it's gonna be fine. Um, that, is in, that is a picture of an actual box that is sitting on one of my archivist desks right now. Um, you can see it's not in the best shape. We have some overstuffed folders. We have some binders with things falling out of them. The box itself is a little threadbare, um, but that's okay. We see this kind of thing all the time. Um, so does every library, archive, museum. Um, but the thing is this, is it might seem overwhelming, but your organization may already have tools in place that will give you a head start on this process and you're just not necessarily aware of them. Um, a good place to start is your human resources office. If you have legal counsel, if you have a corporate compliance officer, um, because organizations create, even if it's a skeletal structure, most organizations create some type of guidelines as to what information that you save, what documents need to be saved permanently, what documents need to be saved for a certain amount of years. Um, and if you can even get a sense of what those guidelines are, what that documentation is, that's a really, really good place to start. Um, and these, these tools are also especially available a lot of times through your information services department, your IT department, your computer people. So talk to them, see what systems have already been put in place for capturing digital information. How are they backing up emails? How are they backing up all the documents that people create? And this can help you and give you some guidance. And I totally understand what, a, what an overwhelming process this must seem like. Um, my first professional job was working for a Jewish organization, for a very large Jewish nonprofit, where we had over 100 years of records scattered across multiple warehouses, and it was extremely overwhelming. But we managed to get a handle on it. And again, if you, you know, just start, start very basically, start thinking about what might already be there to help you and inform the process a little bit. Okay. Um, so second question that we hear all the time, I don't know what to give you. I'm not sure what's important enough for inclusion. Um, and the short answer is, that's okay. We can help with that too. Um, and the first step in that process is to think about assessment. Um, and I put in three images here, which are images of all of the kinds of things that we have in the collections here. Um, the one on the far left, well, my left, um, are bats that are from Hank Greenberg, um, the famous baseball player. They're actually sitting right they're sitting right on my desk right now. Um, so we obviously take objects. The middle slide is from the collection of the Hadassah organization. And those are actually art projects that were done by children in what was then Palestine in um, the 1920s when Hadassah sent public health nurses to go um, to, go to uh, what was then Palestine and um, do nutritional counseling for the local population. So what those actually are, are children's art projects that um, that are written in Hebrew that are recipes and basic nutritional guidelines. Um, and so those are part of the Hadassah collection as well. And those are some of my favorite things. They are absolutely adorable. Um, and the third one, you can't read it. That's also one of my favorites. That was actually something that fell out of a book that was given to us, which was a book that was used um, by a Hebrew school teacher. And it's actually a letter that, um, that fell out of it um, saying that Howard Shapiro could not do his Hebrew school homework uh, this weekend because he had important family things that he had to take care of. And so, you know, this is a, an odd assortment of things, but it just goes to show 
all the different things that we collect here, all of these have been used by researchers. In fact, that letter that fell out of a book was found by a researcher who came to look at that book. We never would have seen it otherwise. So don't worry about what's important enough for inclusion because our feeling is, you know what, almost all of it is probably important enough for inclusion. You never know what historians or social scientists or genealogists or any of the wide variety of people that come to use our collections will find important because all of these things give a window into very specific times and places and things that were happening in the Jewish community and society sort of at large at those times. Um, and so what assessment essentially is, is us asking a series of questions or you asking these questions of yourself. And these are really basic questions that are who, what, when, where, um, you know, who's, who does the collection document? What does it document? Uh, what people are mentioned in it? What does your organization do? What other organizations um, sort of exist in your larger orbit of the, the same organizations that do similar work? How much material is it? Roughly speaking, you know, is it a warehouse? Is it a filing cabinet? Is it 10 boxes in somebody's basement? Um, what is sort of the general condition of it and where is it physically located? Uh, again, very basic kind of things, you know. It's been sitting in our basement. We shipped it all off site. Um, if you're an organization like the one that I used to work for, the answer to that was our documentation for over 100 years is scattered in five warehouses and 30 different work sites, right? So there's a lot of different answers to that question. And lastly, what kind of material is it? Uh, is it paper? Like just, you know, uh, your straight up files, is it photos? Is it films? Is it publications? How much of it is digital? And it has been my experience that most places now, it's a mix. You know, there'll be paper files, there'll be hard drives, there'll be, you know, organizations generate an enormous amount of documentation over the course of their lives. And all of it, potentially all of it, may be of interest to researchers. Um, you know, they get any documents that really show sort of people's daily lives or the daily business activities of organizations are excellent candidates for inclusion in an archive. Um, another hey, question. Melanie, yes. can I, Melanie, can I interrupt you just for one second? Absolutely. Can you just put your screen on, can you put the presentation on the present mode? Because oh, okay. I can't see anything because I'm going blind, so. No problem, let me see. A little bigger. Yeah. If you just click present. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so much better. Thank you. Okay, but can you guys, can everyone see the screen fully? Because when I do it, like, yeah, okay. I wasn't sure if everyone can. So, yeah, so these are, you can see, yes, Mrs. Gertrude Shapiro's letter about poor Howard, who can't do his Hebrew school homework. Um, but the other thing that you should ask yourselves, and um, this is something that all organizations need to decide for themselves, is are you still using your collection? Um, what out of it can you part with? Because if these are materials that you're so regularly using over the course of your daily business, um, you may need to think about you know, donating it in parts. Um, and we've done that with organizations. Places have said to us, we can give you the first 50 years, um, so we can give you up to this point, but then we have to give you everything else on a rolling basis. Um, so that's something you need to think about, that will not having immediate daily access to your materials um, somehow hinder your business operations. Um, and that's something, again, that we can also help you with as well. So, uh, so yeah, and question number three, I don't understand this whole digital thing. Um, can you help? Again, the answer is absolutely, because part of the assessment process is getting a handle on what digital and what analog materials that you have. Um, and digital materials really refers to anything that you produce on your computer, right? memos, spreadsheets, emails, web pages, social media, no matter what the program you use might be. And most organizations, this comes in a variety. If you're looking at 20 years of born digital materials, you're gonna see stuff from the latest version of Word and social media to the little screenshot here of WordPerfect 5.1, um, any of these kind of things. And, but places like us and, and other comparable institutions can help you with this, that we can help migrate and preserve your digital content no matter what format it's in, um, even if it's not a program that people use anymore. Um, I like to think that most people don't use WordPerfect 5.1, um, but these are things that we can help with um, by assessing and again, being able to migrate and frequently stabilize a lot of this kind of born digital content as well um, to make sure that it's, that it's available for a long time. So question and question four, 
What about sensitive or confidential material? Um, you know, and the answer is we can help with that too. This is obviously really an issue um, for a lot of nonprofits because you frequently are dealing with sensitive information. You might be dealing with client files where you have um, an enormous amount of personal information from people. Um, the place that I worked at, we um, were doing mental health. So um, we were talking about 50, 60 years of client files. Um, so but we can help with that. We can help you navigate some of the legal issues around privacy. This is an important part of assessment because then when we create a processing plan, we keep all of this in mind. We evaluate your materials and figure out the best strategy to make them accessible, but also make sure that we are adhering to any applicable laws and also protecting people's privacy. Um, sometimes this means restricting materials. Like you can see in the picture here, it contains restricted materials. Um, that means that for some reason or another, um, this box, uh, we need to think carefully about who it is, how it is given out. Um, a lot of times here, restrictions mean restrictions because of condition. In the case of this box, it's because um, a lot of this stuff is very old and very fragile. But we frequently restrict materials um, sometime, you know, usually for prescribed periods of time um, in order to protect people's privacy. Uh, for example, AJHS holds the records of many um, orphan asylums from the late 19th and early 20th century. And so what we've done with that is we crafted a policy where these things become accessible on a rolling basis. So it's usually 75 years from the last date that's in the ledger. So, you know, every year a new year becomes accessible to the public based on this sort of rolling um, schedule. And that's the kind of thing that we can help you to work out. Um, and we like to, we like to create these kind of guidelines with organizations, you know, in a really responsive and collaborative manner that balances both the need for access and preservation, but also, uh, you know, again, legal issues, um, but also people's just general right to privacy as well. So, the next one. Um, and so please keep in mind that AJHS or other organizations um, can help at any step of this process. You know, even if say you, you go to your HR department and find out there is no formal retention schedule, or you go to IT and they say, we really don't have a lot of formal structures in place for doing backup, that's okay. Um, those are good places to start, but it, should you decide you wanna place your papers, um, any library or archive should be able to work with you um, to make the process collaborative and helpful to everybody. But the other thing that I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, these are really basic principles here, but every collection is unique. And as such, we, we at HHS treat um, each collection individually um, to tailor this entire process to the needs of the organizations and to the individuals involved. You know, there's, there's no real cookie cutter approach. There's no just standard form that we use um, or a standard process. You know, we really assess each one individually. Um, but I view this as a really positive thing, you know, that, um, that it allows us to treat each collection and organization individually uh, and to craft these policies and strategies in a way that works for everyone, uh, particularly around sensitive issues, privacy restrictions, um, any of those things that may, uh, that may make you nervous, that may make you uncomfortable about the idea of your archive being placed at a historical institution. Um, so to, you know, sort of just generally sort of summarize, I get that it can be overwhelming when you look in your file cabinets and you see this, and this actually isn't that bad. I mean, this is at least that the files are labeled. Um, there's, there's at least an order to it. There's some semblance of classification, but I get that it, it seems overwhelming, especially if this isn't two file cabinets, this is a warehouse, this is a basement, this is multiple offices. Um, and you see this, but it's okay because, you know, working with a place like us or a comparable institution, we can get you from this to this, which is, and it might seem insurmountable, but you can, but we can do it um, to get to this, which are fully processed records, rehoused um, in archival, stable boxes, well described for researchers, but most importantly, so we get to this. But then where we get is we get to this. Um, so this is where materials are viewed here. Um, this is the reading room for AJHS and our other four institutional partners. And this is a reading room where researchers of all different disciplines sit every day and look at these kind of collections. And, um, and I think it's a, wonderful, um, it's a wonderful reading room and it's, um, it's also a wonderful collection here. And given the other things that we have, um, you know, taking the collections of family foundations 
other Jewish philanthropic organizations is such a good fit here because we have so many others that are similar to it. And before I came to AJHS, I actually ran this reading room for seven years. So I have a very unique perspective in that I know what historians and social scientists and genealogists and researchers are looking at every day. And most of the most commonly used collections here are the ones of foundations and philanthropic organizations and family foundations. Um, you know, these are the top five for the most part that are used all the time, which is a shift because it really used to be the family papers of important people, historic families, but now um, you know, it just changes in historiography and areas of interest and, you know, sort of a more granular type of social history. We're seeing people that want to mine these kind of institutional collections really deeply. And, um, and that's something that we, that we can absolutely help you with. And then last, so, you know, to, to get these things into the reading room is wonderful, but we also then get to create something like this, which is a finding aid. And what a finding aid does is so after we've taken all the boxes and we've organized everything and we've put it into stable housing, we create something like this, um, which is a finding aid, which is essentially like a book has a table of contents, an archival collection, this is the same. So it says, this is for a family uh, collection, one of, our, one of our older family collections, the Franks family. Um, but if you scroll down or if you can see the entire screen, you can see it is very rich and very full and gives any researchers an enormous amount of information about the organization or family involved. A descriptive summary, um, a scope and content note, which explains what's in it, the years, the topics. But what's also really important and is a really rich thing that we can provide here is where it says related material. So what that means a lot of times is so then there would be a list and links to these finding aids for other institutions that do similar work or other people, individual people whose papers we may have that have done similar work as well. Um, so I think that is the end, that is the end of my slides. Um, so now I guess uh, we can go to questions, I, I guess, if that's... Yes, I would like to thank you all so much. I would like to encourage people to raise their hand and speak up and ask the questions or on the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A uh, Q box and please uh, ask your questions there. And Melanie, you can unshare your screen now if you want. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I am not quite sure how to do that, but. Um, right I down at the, the the share button at the very, if you go all the way down yeah, to the bottom. Mine has, yeah, mine has disappeared somehow, but I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll get there. Okay, I see somebody wants to see Shaw. Can you please ask your question? Thank you. Thank you. This has been so beneficial. Um, my name is Cynthia Shaw, and I'm the Senior Communications Officer at the William Davidson Foundation. And our foundation is, will be 10 years old next year, but it, is a family foundation and it's just had professional staff for the last couple of years. And I've been concerned about how to capture things for, as you ladies have discussed, the next hundred years. I came from a foundation that was approaching its hundredth anniversary and there was so little saved that, uh, it, it, you know, I was set, I'm so aware of a deficit, what the deficit looks like. So my question is, mm -hmm. at what point, how soon should an organization be thinking about this? Our founder will have been gone, deceased, um, 10 years next year. And we've had professional staff since uh, late 2014. So in that regard, we're very, very young. That's OK. Um, should I? Um, I mean, if I can weigh in, I mean, that's fine. One of the things that I always say to people is you shouldn't be concerned that your institution or whatever isn't old enough, isn't venerable enough, um, because what all of these collections do is they show a snapshot of like a certain point in time. Um, so you're not too young to start thinking about it at all. You might want to start thinking about it now and start that's thinking okay. about, yeah, like what, what kind of things you're keeping, what kind of things you want to keep. Uh, um, you know, there's no... There's no better time, honestly, than to start at the beginning because then you'll be ahead of the game when you decide in 10 years or whatever it is that you do want to start depositing your papers. You will already have a structure in place. And I mean, I would suggest starting with a records management plan, which essentially um, you can hire consultants to do it. Um, you could even just, I'm, I'm also happy to um, send out information to anybody if you just 
contact me directly um, for some resources. But all a records management retention plan is, is just a guide. It can be one page. I've seen ones that are as small as one page. The place I worked at, our retention schedule was 30 or 40 pages, both sides, um, because we were 100 years old and we had generated so much documentation and it all needed to be accounted for. But just saying, what do we keep forever? Like number one, you know, a lot of times that's things like your articles of incorporation, your founding documents, um, board minutes. Um, those are the kind of common things that places keep permanently. Then you have your financial records, which, you know, um, I guess seven years is sort of the guideline usually because that's the IRS guideline. Um, and then and then you go from there. Like you basically start looking at what kinds of documents are we creating? How long do we want to keep them? And then you can go from there. And like starting just to think about that so you don't inadvertently throw away things that, um, you know, that might someday be useful. Financial records are kind of a hard one because on one hand, they're incredibly valuable, but on the other hand, if you're still an ongoing organization, right. um, you may be advised to only keep things for a certain amount of time. Okay. Because there can be, uh, you know, there are other issues at play for ongoing organizations. Um, but that's something that, you know, also, again, if you have an HR or a corporate compliance department or anything like that, they can help you craft that as well. I just right. want to jump in that. Thank you. In my research, as I've spoken to different people uh, who are working in the foundation world, and talking about doing archives, sometimes they say that that process that Melanie was just describing can be really helpful, especially if they're doing any kind of strategic planning. So I think to, you know, make sure that there are ways that this archiving question can actually integrate with the daily work that you're doing. Um, you know, if it's seen as a totally separate thing, then it does feel like perhaps like and a lot of extra work, but you know, you can talk to others, but what I've heard, the feedback I've heard is that often that process um, is working in tandem with other kinds of, you know, assessment and thinking about future plans that organizations are doing. So, so it can actually kind of function in a really useful way, I think. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Can I also jump in with a thought, which is, Cynthia, that was such a good question because there's also a, there's a whole prehistory to the foundation in your case, and I think in, in other funders' cases as well, right? With Mr. Davidson's personal papers, wherever those are, and all the philanthropy that he did before the foundation had a professional staff. So it's also worth thinking about where that stuff is and how that gets collected and how it gets integrated with the, with the papers of the foundation, you know, post the first hire. That's a huge point. Thank you very much, all three of you. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Well, I have a quick question. Um, you touched on digital, and I was wondering, um, and just reflecting on the picture that you showed of that very sweet letter mm -hmm. that just dropped out of the book, and some of that kind of history of the feel of, of what it was maybe to to live at that time and the different things in the family life at that point and writing those kind of letters to teachers. How do we do that in um, that personal touch in a digital age when maybe things are text and emails and things are just deleted right away? And what would be important in this kind of context um, to maybe save or print or uh, uh, I don't know, but if you can reflect on that. I mean, different places handle it differently, to be honest with you. You know, we have some places that um, that printed out an enormous amount of stuff in lieu of giving um, access to, like, say, entire hard drives um, or entire, you know, email correspondences. Because the other thing, too, is, you know, nowadays people forget how much of what we do now is totally digital. You know, I mean, I know for myself almost, I would say 95% of my work is done in Outlook in my email. I generate very little, um, you know, paper documentation. And that can also be very daunting because you think about how big it is. Like, you know, think about how many emails are in your inbox. Um, one of the things though that's really good about um, digital archiving is there's a lot of tools that can be, that are created that help manage that. So for example, for say email, um, say you're concerned, well, we're giving you 50,000 emails, right? How much in, in these is really probative? You know, how much of these, like, do we really want, you know, everyone's personal emails where they're sending each other cat pictures or, you know, or some of these things where, um, you know, is that worth saving? 
Um, the tools that are available now, we use a tool called EPAD here, for example, which um, helps with email archiving and also helps sort and delineate what is sort of actual good savable content as opposed to sort of like people's personal things or potentially things that you want to keep private. Um, you know, again, if there are legal, um, you know, legal reasons why this should not be accessible, things like HIPAA or FERPA, if you're dealing with, um, you know, children or anything related to schools, um, any legal issues, things that might fall under like attorney client. And so we can help, we can literally write algorithms in these programs that sort out a lot of that. So some of that you don't necessarily need to worry about in terms of whittling things down. And actually, um, most archives will tell you they'd prefer that you didn't. They would prefer, even if it seems like a lot of stuff, that you give us everything and then work with us to try to figure out what gets, what gets taken out. Do you know what I mean? Um, but it is, I mean, it's an enormous amount of content. And a lot of what we do, honestly, is um, stabilizing file formats because just on, you know, on my computer, I don't even know how many different file formats I have. And file formats become unstable over time. So a lot of what we do is we image entire hard drives and then um, you know, convert to stable file formats and then sort from there. And then we make these things visible and accessible either through our digital asset manager, where it's like a static image, say, um, or through a born digital workstation where people can say view selected parts of the hard drive, but they can't, there's no editing capacity. It's just a dumb terminal where essentially, almost like a microfilm reader where you just sort of go through um, you know, all the different files, um, but they're, they're just image, they're static. Okay. So I see a question from Orly. Yes. Do you want to, yeah. Do you want to so, read it? So Orly, you're an archivist uh, who works at a philanthropic organization dealing with, and your work deals mostly in donor records, internal purposes. Um, and I actually think that insofar as philanthropic organizations internally hire archivists. This is exactly why they're doing it. Sometimes it's a big, big family foundation and the archivist is almost like a family historian. So I've spoken to some of those archivists and then others who are similarly keeping records of donors and using that for, you know, internal decisions about moving forward, about who to approach for different projects. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, from the perspective of, a, of an historian, those records are just incredibly important because they're going to give a window into both what donors were thinking about, what mattered to them, and how the foundation was kind of sculpting their projects and their missions around what donors were interested in and, and just that kind of balance. So I understand, I mean, I think insofar as your colleagues must understand how important these records are for their daily work in the kind of near term, in a way it's analogous why it's important for historians, right? Because although we're not going to be making policy decisions about, you know, what project to fund or which donor to go to, we're going to be asking questions about, um, you know, how did these kinds of conversations about what was or wasn't significant happen? Uh, what kinds of material resources did somebody have to bring in order to set a particular agenda? All those kinds of things. So I would almost kind of leverage the fact that I'm sure your colleagues understand why they're important right now to the work they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, have that as an opening to a conversation about why in the future they'll be important so that historians can ask these big questions. I just also wanted to add um, to the question that Tamar had asked before about personal things. Um, many of the collections we have include oral histories that were done within organizations. Mm -hmm. And that lends a kind of another element and another window on the motivations for people getting involved as leaders, as volunteers. So it's possible, too, that your organization might want to think about having oral histories or they might already have them. And yeah. that, too, can become part of an archive. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a few more minutes if anybody else has questions. I see um, Shira, you raised your hand if you would like to Hi. ask Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, Thank great. you. Hi, it's Shira Hudson. I work at UJA Federation, and we are so fortunate to have our collection at AJHS. So thank you for that and for this helpful webinar. Um, so I have two questions. One is that I mentioned this webinar to someone who does work at a family foundation, and his response was exactly what you've heard, Lila, which is, well, what else, what else is there that we should be saving besides from our grant checks? What else would be important? Um, so aside from board minutes or a mission statement, 
what specifically would be helpful for foundations to either be saving and clearly they're not thinking about it or what should be proactively created that could be helpful in the future. Um, and sort of along the same lines um, in the existing collections that you do have, Melanie, maybe this is a question for you, but are there major holes that you see that like, you know, organizations have kept, like we've kept, you know, all of our board members, we have our histories. Are there major holes that you're like, oh, I wish they would have held on to that um, that you see across the board? The board? Um, no, I don't, I don't so much see that because what we've, what we have here with a lot of, especially like these large organizational collections though, a lot of times there are restrictions. Um, that there are things that, so organizations will donate the totality of it, but then request that certain specific things, largely um, things related to say like executive committee meetings, um, things like that are kept restricted for say 20 to 30 years because those frequently are conversations where people had some expectation of privacy, that these were things that weren't going into the board minutes. These were things that, um, you know, were essentially private conversations between sort of the people involved. And there was a bit of an expectation of privacy that they did not, think that those minutes would be made public. Um, but so again, so what we did is then we craft policies and say, well, yeah, but in 30 years, will anybody really be upset if, if these minutes are, are released? So um, it's not, so, no, I don't really see like a lot of holes particularly um, in the collections. Well, except in that sometimes, um, not so much the types of documentation, but the time span. You know, you have organizations where say we'll get a solid 10 years and then there'll be a gap because whoever was working there, because there was no consistent records management policy and people, some, one person would save all this stuff and be consistent about it, would leave. And then somebody new would come in and say, we're not keeping this or, you know, why are we, why are we saving all this stuff? And so go about it differently. Like with a lot of the Hebrew orphan asylum records, we have ledgers where uh, one year will be incredibly complete and then we'll be missing a year because nobody kept it because somebody threw it out. Um, or there'll be other years where the entries are much more sparse because it has to do with literally the person who is sitting there with a pen on any given day taking down the information um, about that stuff. So I feel like a lot of the holes that we see are not really so much by design, but more just by the idiosyncratic nature of organizations and like employee turnover and um, not being consistent records management policies, I would say. Um, I would just add that sometimes our archivists fill in holes. So I saw an archivist uh, last week talk about a file she processed from a German Jewish refugee um, and noted there was a letter in there and the letter seemed to be a response. The letter was from his wife, uh, who is like to be, that was, it seemed to be a response to a personal ad. So the archivist of her own initiative said, oh, where could this personal ad be? And found it in the Ausbau, the German Jewish newspaper at the time. So our archivists are often highly skilled in the areas that they're working in. And if they see a hole, if they see something where, oh, the public record might have an answer to this question, they'll start to piece it together. And the process of archiving is fascinating in and of itself because the archivists really get a sense of what an organization is going through in part by how they are organizing it. So there's more to the story that happens and our archivists tend to become very attached to people who lived in the 1920s or the 1930s because they understand who they are because they're fingering their work and trying to understand their work as they are you know doing almost like solving a mystery and coming up with really interesting things. Um, and in terms of one of the most, and this is not at this at the center, but at the New York Public Library, they have a record of the Seward Park Library, which was a public library on the Lower East Side. And every year, the librarians wrote an informal report. And it was like two pages of basically the librarians sitting back and being like, this year we saw a lot of Puerto Ricans come. And there was a wonderful story of a woman who was knitting, who helped us. Those windows are fascinating. Um, and so it's hard to tell you how to do that. But I, I think that the more, once if you put in a records management policy or you enhance your record management policy or you're thinking about your strategic vision, you might want to step back and say, what kind of reflection can your team be doing as you're going that you then want to save and incorporate into what you're doing? Because those windows are just as fascinating as you know, Lila saying, looking at the donor file of why the person was motivated to do it. Why you, who are working at the institution, are doing what you're doing and what you notice and what you observe is a, a remarkable window. Yeah, 
And piggybacking on that, I was thinking one of the best things that, um, one of the things that we've saved at Natan that I feel like will be the most helpful in the future are all of the grant applications that we've gotten. So every couple of, you know, every year we get a couple hundred grant applications. That's an incredible, I mean, A, it's, you know, educational for us as foundation folks trying to decide what to fund, but it's an incredible uh, window into the landscape of programs happening right now. Um, and I remember there was a year, a couple, we, we wound up moving to a WeWork where we had to basically, you know, not take any of our papers with us and we put it all into storage. And so we had to decide what to keep and what to throw away. And somebody said, why don't we just throw away all the, organi all the applications from organizations that we didn't fund? Because that doesn't have anything to do with Natan. And I was like, no, like it's not, the work that we do day to day is just a small piece of the story that we need to save. And all of those hundreds of applications every year are the real story. The work that we do is just a tiny slice of that. Yeah. And we're starting to approach work with an organization that has sent um, really gifted students to Israel um, every year for the last 30 or 40 years. And looking at those applications, you get a sense over time as to what American Jews think about Israel through the prism of a 17-year-old articulating why he or she would like to go on this program. Um, and what's amazing, too, is that then a lot of these students who have gone on the program grow up to be important alumni of their own right. And to be able to have their record of, as a 17-year-old, what they're saying is, is really neat. So there's all sorts of interesting ways in which um, American Jewish trends are traced through your organizational records, both through what you fund, what you don't fund, and getting a sense of the terrain of the time. Very good. Thank you so much. We are just about out of time. I want to thank everybody for um, participating and I want to really thank all of our presenters for bringing this to to our attention and for having such a wonderful, lively conversation and a lot of things for us to think about going forward. Um, and so with that, I want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of your afternoon and happy Hanukkah and hope to, to see you all again soon. Have a good day. <laughs>